data availability. If you've been reading about rollups, uh, it's probably something you've come across, but it's not always clear what it is. If you take a um, traditional blockchain like Bitcoin, for example, you'll find that the miners and validators do several important functions, one of which is ordering transaction. And that's really key for ensuring that there's no double spend. You want to know who came first. The other one is executing transaction. And that's mostly an optimization. It's just convenience, especially if you want to build um, a simple payment verification where you're just looking at a couple blocks. And if you see a transaction in a couple blocks, it's valid because the miners would not have included an invalid transaction. And the third thing that they do, which is super important, is making the data available. And that might sound a little strange. Why do we need that? You know, in practice, you could just have the hashes of the transaction and the miners could just decide that they're only going to include valid transaction. And then you could verify that a specific transaction has been included. But if you were to do that, uh, other people wouldn't be able to validate the chain. As an honest party, you want to be able to look at the blocks and verify for yourself that it is valid. You want to also be able to make transaction if you don't know the state of the chain, if you don't know what, what, are, the, you know, what are the different balances, you can't really do that. So it's a bit abstract, but if you um, start looking into rollups, the concept becomes a lot more obvious. So the way a rollup work usually is you put in a transaction on a layer one, but it's not going to be executed. At least not by the validators, not by the block producers. It's going to be executed by different parties. Um, those who are rollup node operators, let's say. They're going to look at these transactions. They're going to monitor the blockchain. They're going to look for this transaction and they execute them on a separate state called the rollup state. And then, depending on the type of rollups, they will make assertions about it. They will go to the main chain and say, I assert that this is the current state of the rollup. And the reason they do this assertion is so that you can transfer assets from the blockchain to the rollup or back and forth. I say asset, but really any type of data communication between the rollup and the main chain is possible because there's a synchronization between the states. And that synchronization comes from the fact that rollup operators can post commitments to the states. In the case of an optimistic rollup, anyone can post any commitment. You can come in and say, oh yeah, sure, that's the state of the rollup. But if you're lying, um, someone can come and prove that you're lying. In an optimistic rollup, you can't prove that something is correct, but you can prove that someone is lying about their commitment. So, so long as you have one honest rollup validator who can come in and show that people are trying to cheat, then you know the, the cheaters will lose money and the rollup will uh, Will proceed. So that's the optimistic rollup, and it has the benefit that um, there's a very little overhead in running it. Uh, the only overhead happens when you actually need to make a proof. In validity rollups, sometimes called zk rollups, it's different. You don't even rely on a one honest party. Um, this, the assertions have to carry crypto cryptographic proof that they're correct, right? So you have oftentimes it's a zero knowledge proof, but it could just be any, any type of verifiable computation proof that yes. I took in all the transactions from the layer one, I executed all of them, and that is the result. But here, the data is being made available through the blockchain. It's being posted on the L1. Do we actually need that? What if we, um, what if we only posted the hashes of the transactions on the, uh, on the L1? What would happen? I mean, if you're a ROM operator, maybe you receive the transaction, and so you don't necessarily care that it's on a, on a chain. And when you make your proof, on a chain, you could prove that, yes, look, um, here's a transaction and that's, uh, that's a state. The problem is what if, you know, only uh, these honest actors know about a transaction and they don't tell anyone else about it. So you could have a valid commitment, but no one would be able to prove that it's valid aside from the people who have the transaction or worse, in the case of an optimistic rollup, you could have an invalid commitment, but no one can prove it's invalid because they're missing some of the inputs, they're missing some of the data. So in an optimistic rollup, if you had a failure of data availability, what it means is someone can pwn the rollup. Like you can, you can extract everything from the rollup. You can prove anything that's false because no one will prove you wrong. So data availability is super important. In the case of a validity rollup, it's a little better, but it's not a lot better. In the case of a validity rollup, if the data is unavailable, um, they can't extract directly funds from the rollups. They can't make invalid statements because the statements are proven with cryptography. However, they can lock out everyone. They can say, look, you'll never get your assets out of the rollup unless you pay us X much. So you can hold funds hostage uh, 
if data availability is compromised. Now, if your data is posted on the main chain, then you don't really have a, uh, a problem here. Your security of your data availability is as good as the security of the data availability of the L1. So you have no loss of security here. However, um, it can be interesting to move this data availability off the chain. And I'll explain how that can be done and why you would want to do it. Before I get into that, I want to address something. In the case of validity rollup, oftentimes, instead of posting the transactions that happen, you can post just the difference in the state, right? So if you had 10,000 transactions happen, you could say, this was the state of my rollup before, this is the state of my rollup after. For the data availability purposes, all I need to do is post the difference between the two, and that's enough. And if you're dealing with applications where the difference is a lot smaller than a set of all transactions, that can be interesting. So for example, um, a lot of back and forth trading, if you have a thousand people and all they do all day is trade the same assets between each other, um, you know that may be a lot of transaction during the day, but beginning and end of the day, the difference in, uh, in, in a ledger will be very small. But some people have seen this as a huge advantage of ZK rollup, and I don't think that's the case. First of all, they're still massively disadvantaged by the cost that it takes to actually produce the proofs, which severely limits the throughput. But also, at the end of the day, it's always it's always linear. You know, it, even if some applications are going to have a, a, a low coefficient, there's typically going to be a somewhat linear relationship between the difference in the state and the amount of transactions that you have. They all keep changing things a little bit permanently, a little bit permanently, right? So you're not going to, um, it's, it, it's not going to scale to um, to much higher level uh, using the technique. The gold standard for doing the data availability in a scalable way is data availability sampling. At least that's the best solution that's known today. And the way data availability sampling works is instead of everyone, every validator downloading everything in every block, the blocks will contain a commitment to the data, but the data will be downloaded by many different people. So people will download a random sample of the data. Now, naively, that's my, you might think this works. You might say, if everyone just downloads a little bit of the data, then with high probability, everyone will have access to all the data, and then you know, we'll, we'll, we'll all be good. But the problem is, you don't know that uh, you, you don't know that all the data is there. Maybe a tiny little bit is missing. And a lot of people could convince themselves that, yes, I have downloaded all the data, but then it misses one byte. You know, all you need is one byte uh, missing out of, a, uh, out of a gigabyte, and you wouldn't have that availability. So that's a, uh, uh, that's, that, that's a difficulty right there. The solution is to turn the data into an error-correcting code. So you take the data, you pad it with more information that lets you detect and repair errors. And if you do that, then you go from a position where you need 100% of the data to be available to everyone, and I mean 100.00000, which is um, almost impossible to achieve, to a situation where you only need 50% of the data to be available. If you have 50% of an error correcting code, and the error correcting code has you know, this ratio of two, then you can reconstruct the whole data. And with very high probability, if people download random samples of the data and they always get it, then with very high probability, 50% of it is available. So that, you know, that's a fundamental idea behind the availability sampling. There's different ways of doing it. In some schemes, uh, you'll have a commitment and then people can challenge the fact that the commitment is a commitment to an error correcting code. In other schemes, it's directly proven cryptographically that it is an error correcting code. I tend to prefer the schemes. And that's something that's being built into, uh, into Tezos. And you have real scaling in that, in, in that respect, in the sense that you're no longer bound by the computation power of a single node. That's already taken care of by rollups, by the way, because you can have multiple rollups in parallel, and not every node has to validate every rollup. So we have this parallelization of compute with rollups, but you don't have parallelization of bandwidth in the sense that you still require every validator of the system to download every single transaction. Now that's no longer the case. Your capacity becomes proportional to the number of participants, to so the total bandwidth of your network, not the bandwidth of the slowest participant in your network. So that's how you really, really um, scale to a very massive throughput while remaining entirely decentralized. So there's an intermediate solution um, that people talk about, and I wanted to present it. 
so that I explain very clearly what the security trade-off is and why I think data availability sampling is still very worthwhile. So that technique is called a data availability committee. And the concept is that instead of putting your data on the L1, which is slow because it has all these different validators, you're going to go to um, a few big data providers and you'll put your data uh, over there. And maybe also they'll just focus on your rollup so it will give you some form of horizontal scaling. So yeah, the idea is like you'll get a multi-signature maybe from a committee and the committee will tell you, oh yeah, 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 we've seen the data. It's all there. It's all, uh, it's all available. You don't, need to, uh, uh, you don't need to worry about it. And if your committee is honest, uh, then it's fine because honest rollup participants will be able to go to them to get the data and then to, um, and then to include it in, uh, in, 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 in proofs uh, if they need to. But what if it's dishonest? So the interesting property is that you can have very, very high standard for what you consider to be available. Let's say you have 100 participants in your data availability committee. You could ask to have 99 out of 100 asserting that the data is available, or you could even have 100 out of 100. You could say, if we don't have 100% of the committee agree that the data is available, then it's not. So in that case, all it takes, you know, all it takes is one honest member and you will not have unavailable data, which is a, you know, which is a pretty reasonable property. Of course, the flip side is that it takes only one dishonest member to cause a big headache because a dishonest member could come and say, oh yeah, that is not available. And in which case, what do you do? Well, what you do in that case is that you still pose the data on the L1. So you still have this option. So one dishonest committee member cannot steal money but they can cause a headache by forcing everyone to go to the L1. But if that happens, um, people can withdraw the funds from the rollup and then move it to another rollup. So the consequences of this are not particularly uh, not particularly bad. It, 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 it causes some form of griefing. So it's an interesting um, it's an interesting model, I think, and it's fairly uh, it's fairly easy to build. But you have to understand that there is a security trade-off in a sense that. Uh, if the participants are, you have a chosen set of participants, if they're all dishonest, they could attack the rollup. And if only a few of them are dishonest, they can cause some uh, important uh, liveness failure. So that is what a uh, data availability committee uh, is. They've been quite popular, uh, especially with um, uh, validity rollups. They're being used in Starkware. Um, I also think now they're being uh, de deployed in, uh, in Arbitrum. So it's definitely a thing and it can get you quite a bit of scalability. But there's a little more centralization that's involved with it. It's not as good as what, again, I think is a gold standard, which is that availability sampling, which is entirely decentralized. Anyway, so those are the differences. I hope this was instructive. Uh, let me know what you think in the comments and don't forget to click like and subscribe.